Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... Well, now that we have had our first cold snap, I have been able to indulge in some homemade pumpkin pie and mulled wine. So at this point, all that's left on my Halloween bucket list is just to shoot some Jaeger bombs, eat some vegan pumpkin chili, and watch horror movies. But despite what the week is going to bring, as many of you know, I've been having Carrie carve up some jack-o'-lanterns in every episode with the intent that they are to be scary. However, that has not been the case at all, because in the last few episodes, I have received a jack-o'-lantern that has a glory hole in it, another jack-o'-lantern that has been dubbed as the dick-o'-lantern, and I've also received a jack-o'-lantern that was flipping me off. So, as you can see, my hopes aren't very high. You ready? <sighs> Bring it. Oh, oh, I love that. You did good. I love that. You like it? Yes, that's what I've been wanting. That looks so good. See? Well, thanks to Carrie's antics, we will have another video where there is no beacon of hope to guide us. But anywho, this weekend, I'm reviewing Ghost Road Blues by Jonathan Mayberry. And what really surprised me about this book was I actually thought that this was something I could read, then pick up its sequel a few months later. But that wasn't the case whatsoever because this book ended with a pretty hardcore cliffhanger. So as soon as I finished reading this, I picked up its sequel. Also, by the way, I buddy read this with my good online friends Gina and Bryce, and we had a wonderful time discussing the characters, the plot, and also quite a bit of its symbolism. So if either of you are watching, I hope you enjoy this review. Now, without further ado, let's head off to Pine Deep and see what's going on in the most haunted town in America. The Horrors of Ghost Road Blues by Jonathan Mayberry begins in Pine Deep, Pennsylvania, 1976, which, during this time, we get introduced to a Mississippi blues musician known as Bone Man, and without receiving much context, we follow him as he chases the devil into a swampy patch of backwoods known as Dark Hollow. Once here, the two have a showdown, and Bone Man actually kills the devil. But since the devil has disguised himself as a man named Ubel Griswold, who is an upstanding pillar of the white community, local racists get together and murder Bone Man, then blame him for the murders that had devastated their town over the last month. From here, we fast forward 30 years and see that Pine Deep has prospered because of its agriculture, as well as its tourism, because over the years, Pine Deep has become known as the most haunted town in America. And since Halloween is right around the corner, tourists are ready to come to town so they can enjoy the attractions, which among those is this elaborate haunted hayride that's ran by the mayor Terry Wolf and is overseen by his childhood friend Malcolm Crow. But while Wolf and Crow are expecting this to be another profitable season without any problems, over the next 24 hours, everything becomes a full-blown nightmare because three criminals have come into town, and among them is their leader, Ruger, who is a ruthless, cold-blooded murderer. However, unbeknownst to everyone, these three criminals at large will be the least of their worries, because in the swampy backwoods of Dark Hollow, the devil has awakened. But at the same time, Bone Man's spirit has returned to defeat him. And now that these two are getting ready for a final showdown, they each form armies who will battle in this apocalyptic event called the Red Wave, which is to take place Halloween night. Published in 2006, Ghost Road Blues was Jonathan Mayberry's first fictional novel. Prior to this work, Mayberry wrote college textbooks and nonfiction articles for magazines. 
Then, in 2000, under the pseudonym Shane McDougall, he published a supernatural nonfiction book called The Vampire Slayer's Field Guide to the Undead. Then, around 2002, he began toying with the idea of writing horror fiction, and eventually Ghost Road Blues followed. But as he wrote, it became obvious that the story he wanted to write wouldn't fit in one volume, so he broke the story into three parts. Since at this time, although horror fiction was on a decline and Ghost Road Blues was only published in paperback, reviewers loved it, and it was nominated twice for the Bram Stoker Award, where it won Best First Novel. Fun Facts since this book focuses on symbols like the wolf, the crow, the owl, and a white stag, here are some things that I found in regards to their significance. From a Christian perspective, the white stag represents Christ and it symbolizes spirituality, illumination, faith, humility, protection, perfection, and the heavens. Whereas in mysticism, the horns of the white stag are like antenna reaching out to the unseen world. And as a spirit animal, it reminds the individual to stop and listen to universal messages, as well as dream messages. Another belief reveals that when one sees the white stag, it suggests a time of being responsible is near and that the individual is approaching a spiritual awakening or event. During this time, the white stag will lend the emotional and spiritual support necessary for one to accomplish the upcoming work. In the past, it has been noted that the crow has duties that are both positive and negative. Among those, it is responsible for life magic, destiny, transformation, granting higher perspective, and the list continues. Also, the crow can be seen as a bad omen that indicates death and dark witchcraft. In ancient mythology, it is believed that the crow is a mediator between life and death, and since crows eat the dead, they embody death and lost souls, whereas another belief states that they are the reincarnation of damned souls. The wolf is seen as a sacred animal that symbolizes loyalty, family, friendship, guardianship, teamwork, protection, and the list continues. Throughout the world, the wolf is one of the most respected and feared animals. And in North America, some tribes believe the wolf represent creation as well as death and rebirth. But in German and Norse mythology, wolves are seen as a symbol of destruction and death. While owls are associated with wisdom, they are seen as mysterious symbols that have magical abilities and ancient knowledge. In ancient Greece, the owl was a guardian of the Acropolis. In Rome, Diana was strongly associated with the moon and the owl, whereas the Pawnee and the Sioux believed the owl was a messenger. Yet in Europe and America, the owl was seen as a harbinger of death. Also, owls are a representation of the feminine and fertility, and the owl was a symbol of the goddess Athena, who was known for wisdom and strategy. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoiler section, which, if you haven't read this before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. And if you would like to click away from this section, all you have to do is scroll down to the comments and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top with a timestamp in it. Once you click that timestamp, it will direct you away from the spoilers and bring you to the thoughts section. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about a few of my favorite moments. First off, I absolutely love the moment when Bone Man killed the devil by using his guitar, which this was a moment that Bryce and I enjoyed together. Now, prior to this, we understand that Bone Man and the devil, who had been disguised as this dude called Griswold, had been at each other's throat for a hot minute. But Bone Man was able to get the upper hand and chase Griswold into the swampy patch of backwoods known as Dark Hollow. And during their chase, it's noted that Bone Man had his guitar strapped to his back. 
well, after he catches up with Griswold, he uses his guitar to beat the hell out of him. Then he uses the broken neck of the guitar to stab him to death. However, after Bone Man buries Griswold, do we come to realize that evil never dies, it just waits. To start with, I would like to note any time the subjects of a Mississippi blues musician and the devil come into play, I instantly think about Robert Johnson. So, because of how these characters and the scene unfolded, I immediately realized that the story ahead of me was going to be a rich folkloric horror story. Now, as I mentioned, I really loved how Bone Man killed the devil with his guitar. And aside from this just being kick-ass in general, it really felt like the guitar had a stronger significance. Like, we understand the guitar is a family heirloom that belonged to Bone Man's uncle, then it was passed down to his father, then he received it. But aside from the guitar having a historic and sentimental value, it honestly felt like it was an extension of Bone Man's soul or an extension of his ancestors. And in this aspect, it kind of felt like it was Bone Man's version of Excalibur's sword or something similar. Another moment that stood out to me was when Bone Man comforted Henry as he passed away, which this was a moment that Gina and I both felt moved by. Now, prior to this, we understand that Henry was a good man who was dearly loved by his family. Also, we understand that something horrible is going to happen to him because of a premonition that Mike had, except we don't know exactly when or how Henry is going to die. But eventually, Ruger shows up at Henry's farm and holds everyone at gunpoint. Then, after he has Henry and Val follow him out to the cornfield, Henry sees the opportunity for Val to escape, and he tells her to run. Which, as soon as he does this, Ruger shoots Henry and leaves him to bleed out on the ground. And this is when Bone Man comes to Henry's side and sings him a soft melody as he passes away. To me, this was extremely emotional for a couple of reasons. Like, to start with, while Bone Man's final act of kindness was simple, I like to think that it made a world of difference for Henry, especially since Henry didn't have to die alone and Bone Man sang him into a peaceful sleep. Also, this really feels like Henry and Bone Man had come full circle at this point, because Bone Man was finally able to return the generosity that Henry had shown him which it's even explained in this scene that Bone Man praises Henry for being kind to him when no one else was. Plus, we understand that Henry was the only person who cared about giving Bone Man a proper burial. So, with that context in mind, I was really happy to see how impactful this moment was without it being overly dramatic. My final favorite moment was when Ruger had his sorry ass kicked. Now, before this went down, it had been established in the previous year that Ruger had gathered up a group of senior citizens and tortured them to death in a lighthouse. Then, as we're caught up to speed, we see where he and his men killed a warehouse full of drug dealers and ran off with the loot. And while Ruger has been having these awful nightmares that he's going to die, instead of him being cautious, he actually challenges death with every opportunity he gets. So, when it came down to the home invasion at the Guthrie farm, I knew shit was going to get real because Ruger had already proven that he was unpredictable and he was capable of doing some really horrible shit, which in this regards he doesn't disappoint. However, when Malcolm shows up, there is a really kick-ass showdown between the two of them because while Ruger isn't one to be messed with, Malcolm knows jujitsu. And even though Malcolm did a pretty good job of kicking Ruger's teeth down his throat, unfortunately, this isn't the last we see of Ruger. So, as you can tell, this moment really didn't have anything that I could elaborate on that would be deeply philosophical or anything like that. Instead, this was just a good old-fashioned ass whooping, and by how it was presented, it made the sky seem bluer, the grass seem greener, and the birds sing sweeter. So, in so many words, I marveled over every single second that this shithead had the piss kicked out of him.
I would like to take this opportunity to bitch about Ruger and Vic. Now, seriously, if I still smoked like a freight train, these twin dicks would have me in hell in a cigarette and one full drag, because let me tell you, when the devil shat them out, he broke the mold. Like, for real. With Ruger, he is this sick bastard who gets his jollies off over torturing elderly people to death. And among all of the shitty things that he does, he tries to rape Connie in front of her husband. Then we have Vic, who is a racist, a murderer, and a family abuser. And what really gets me about this asshole is, he abuses his family in public and gets away with it. Which, don't get me wrong, I understand that the dude is built like a brick shit house, but if I was the mayor of this town, I would have a special event where the community would come together and we would take this bastard down as one. And y'all, don't get me wrong, I am a peaceful person. I truly, truly am. Just hear me out. I'm peaceful. I am. But there is something within the core of my being that wishes that someone would take these two jackasses and shave a few inches off of their tallywhackers with a cheese grater. Ghost Road Blues by Jonathan Mayberry is an epic folkloric horror story that's rich with character and scenery. And while I wasn't expecting this book to be as heavy as what it is, it focuses on racism, scapegoatism, mob mentality, domestic abuse, grief, self-blame, drug abuse, and much more. Character-wise, because of how everyone felt so fleshed out, I was reminded of Stephen King's The Stand or Peter Straub's Ghost Story. Which, by the way, if you have a hard time remembering names, my best suggestion is to get a pen and paper and make note of all the characters as you come in contact with them, because even the most insignificant character plays the most vital role in this book. Now, as far as my favorite character is concerned, I would have to say Malcolm Crow, because even though he wasn't the smartest, he had overcome a lot of shit, he kicks a lot of ass, and he has a true heart of gold. Also, I was really impressed with Terry Wolf because at first I thought he was just going to be another money-grubbing politician, but the more I learned about him, the more I saw he actually cared for his community. And as far as Gina and Bryce are concerned, Gina said her favorite character was Mike because of everything he had been through, and Bryce said that he really liked Val, which these were both really strong characters who I felt connected with as well. Theme-wise, racism is a huge topic of this novel, which this is mostly seen in 1976 when Bone Man was murdered. And with this tragedy come the topics of scapegoatism, mob mentality, and whitewashing. Now, as I had mentioned in the synopsis, the black character known as Bone Man had saved Pine Deep by killing the devil who had been disguised as a white man. However, after he did this, a group of local white men gang up on Bone Man and blame him for the murders that had been occurring when he had been innocent. From here, they beat Bone Man to death and mislabel him as being the infamous serial killer known as the Reaper, which because of them blaming him for these murders, his reputation never recovers. Meanwhile, Griswold, who was actually the one who killed everybody, maintains a good name. And as the story progresses into current time, we see how the corruption of the past never really died. Instead, it just simply learned how to wear a more subtle mask and disguise itself better as being authority figures and good old boys. Up next is domestic abuse. And truth be it, if you're a child abuse survivor, you might want to skip this book because there are some pretty graphic scenes. But due to how the abuse is portrayed, we see how the abuser constantly gets worse when no one intervenes. Like, a good example is seen when Vic gut punches Mike in public, and it notes that Vic had never used a balled-up fist on Mike until now. Then, when they get home, Vic literally beats Mike from one end of the house to the other. And while it seems like everyone in town knows what's going on, no one intervenes. Which, because of Vic getting away with this, his abuse constantly gets worse. 
Two other subjects that I noticed were grief and self-blame, which I can't elaborate on these too much without giving away the intensity of what happened at the Guthrie farm. But I can say that because of what goes down, we see where a loving family is split apart, and for those who do survive, we see where they blame themselves for things that were out of their control. So, while keeping those subjects in mind, this leads us to the topic of substance abuse, which this is mostly seen by how Terry abuses his prescription meds and alcohol due to his depression and anxiety. Now, I understand that Terry is grieving a great deal because of his little sister who was murdered, and truth be it, he blames himself a lot for her death, even though there was nothing he could have done differently. But on top of that, he has a lot of stuff going on in his everyday life that is just being unresolved. Which, I think Terry is the perfect example of how meds can be a good band-aid if they're used properly. But at the same time, to aid the healing process, you have to find positive ways to cope. Aside from Terry, Mike's mom Lois uses alcohol to cope with Vic's brutality and the loss of her first husband, which in this case we see that she remains in a weakened state where she's never able to rise above to save herself or her son. And truth be it, I see her as being the perfect example of someone who is stuck in a cycle of abuse and they don't know how to save themselves from it because their abuser keeps them in a low place where they can maintain an upper hand. Now, I could go on for hours about the other topics that I noticed in this book, but if I did, this video would be about an hour long, so just know I'm going to be reviewing the sequel next weekend, and I'll touch on a few more topics then. Ghost Road Blues didn't scare me or gross me out, but there were actually quite a few creepy scenes, and the further I read, the more intense everything became. Ghost Road Blues by Jonathan Mayberry was a well-written, fast-paced read that presented characters who I quickly became invested with. And I really loved how every time I thought the book couldn't get any deeper, Mayberry came along with his wheelbarrow and dumped off another load of suspense and horror. But what really impressed me was, even though this book is like around 433 pages long, everything that takes place in this happens over about a day or so. But overall, Bryce, Gina, and I really enjoyed this book, and even though it takes place at the end of September, we felt like it had some strong Halloween vibes and that it was perfect for this time of year. So overall, I do highly recommend this book. On to the questions. What is a folkloric horror book that you would recommend? Also, since the story features a haunted hayride, have you ever done a hayride? If so, what was your experience? Personally, I've always wanted to do one, but I've never had the opportunity to. However, there was this one fateful Halloween where I was sitting on my front steps waiting for my friends to show up, and I had on a leather face mask, and there was a severed head I had made and stuck on the end of a stick. And since I live in the middle of nowhere, I wasn't expecting anyone else to drive by or pull up. But lo and behold, this tractor is creeping down the street and attached to it is this hayride full of kids. Which, of course, I'm not one to pass up an opportunity. So I stood up and took the stick with the severed head and started beating it into the ground. And, <laughs> you know, I can still hear those kids screaming today. And yeah, even though I haven't actually been a part of a hayride, I did contribute to that moment, and I think that I gave those kids a very memorable Halloween. Now that it's time to close out the video, I would like to take this opportunity to brag about some of the goodies I received this week. Which, first up, my good friend Gina sent me this book by Augustine Calvert, and I've not read him before, but I know this is a nonfiction book, and it regards spirits, vampires, and all kind of supernatural goodness that people swore by back in the day. So I'm really excited to dive into this and perhaps use it as a reference book for maybe some of my own creativity. Last summer, Carrie and I had the opportunity to meet some of my relatives from Florida who I had never seen before, and during that time we had a really great bonding experience. 
But recently, they sent Carrie and I this really awesome puzzle of the Haunted Mansion, which we really love the Haunted Mansion because it's just a lot of fun. Of course, I'm a horror fan, so I'm going to be drawn to it. But in the third episode I did for my channel, I reviewed the book Tales from the Haunted Mansion, and I elaborate about a experience that Carrie and I had there. So if you haven't seen that video, be sure to check it out. Also, we have a thing for Lilo and Stitch, so they sent us a Pride Stitch button, which we absolutely love. Also, they sent us over this really cool wall block that says chocolate is pretty much a salad and it explains how it's a salad, so that was adorable. And they sent us these really cool soup mugs, like, check it out. The skeletons and jack-o'-lanterns, just absolutely adorable. And all of this stuff is going to get put to good use. So I would like to say thank you to my relatives and to Gina for loading us up with all of these goodies. Also, before I close out, I would like to thank these wonderful people for contributing to my Patreon account. Here's a list of my Patreon contributors, and as you can see, some of them are creators, so be sure to check them out. And if you would like to contribute to my Patreon account as well, just go to the description section of this video and you'll see that I have a link available. And for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos like what you see here. And for $10 a month, I'll still give you that shout out, but I do creepy photography on the side. So at the beginning of every month, I'll send you over one of my creepy photos. And once you receive that, you can print it off, do whatever you want with it. So if you're able to do that, that's awesome. If not, no sweat. I just hope you return to this channel so we can have a good time together. And if you would like to hit me up on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this episode. And if you have not subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe to this channel and click that notifications bell because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.